Now, if I wanted to summarize in one word the decisive difference and the decisive advantage of a competitive security industry as compared to the current status practice, this word would be contract. The state, as the ultimate decision maker and judge, operates in a contractless legal vacuum. There exists no contract between the state and its citizens. We do not have a contract that says, I will do such and such under such and such circumstances. It is not contractually fixed what is actually owned by whom and what, accordingly, is to be protected. The state does not say, you own your income. No, it says, you make an income and I tell you how much you can keep and how much I will take. Um, it is not fixed what service the state is to provide. It is not fixed what is to happen if the state fails in its duty, nor what the price is that the, custom, the customer, so to speak, of the service that the state uh, offers must pay for this service. Tax rates are flexible. They don't say tax is this and never will be changed. They never ask us if they change it, if that is okay. No, none of these things are fixed. Rather, the state unilaterally fixes the rules of the game, the laws, and can change them by legislation during the game. Um, obviously, such a behavior is inconceivable for freely financed security providers. Imagine this. Just imagine a private security provider, regardless whether it's a police, an insurer, or an arbitrator, whose offer consisted in something like this. He would say, I will not contractually guarantee you anything. I will not tell you what specific things I will regard as your to be protected property. Nor will I tell you what I oblige myself to do if, according to your opinion, I do not fulfill my service to you. But in any case, I reserve the right to unilaterally determine the price that you must pay me for such undefined service. <laughs> now, now any, any such security provider would, be, would immediately disappear from the market due, com to, a, due to a complete lack of, uh, of demand from the side of customers. Each private, freely financed security producer instead must offer its protective clients a contract, first of all. And these contracts must, in order to be acceptable or to appear acceptable by voluntarily paying clients, contain clear property descriptions as well as clearly defined mutual services and obligations. Moreover, each party to a contract for the duration and until the fulfillment of the contract would be bound by its terms and conditions and every change of the terms and conditions would require the unanimous consent of all parties concerned. So again, the state, again, let me just emphasize, the state can of course just pass different laws as if you are just in, in, a, in, a, in a football game, in the middle of the football game, uh, the, the penalty rules will be changed. Um, in, in, instead of just agreeing on that from the, from the outset or insisting, of course we can change it in the middle of the game, but only if we both agree on in which way they should be changed. Now more specifically, in order to appear acceptable to security buyers. These contracts must contain provisions about what will be done in the case of a conflict or dispute between the alleged protector or insurer and his own protected or insured clients. That is, if there is a client between the insurance company 
and the, uh, the insurance company and the, the client of this company, nobody would sign a contract unless there would be some ruling what will happen in such a case. Um, and these contracts must also contain provisions uh, what will happen in the case of a conflict between different protecting agencies or different insurers and their respective clients. Everybody knows there can be also conflicts between different insurers. What will we do if there is a conflict between this insurer and that insurer? And each insurer will have to have provisions in its contract what procedure will be put in motion if that case arises because everyone knows that case of course can arise also. And in this regard only one mutually agreeable solution exists. In these cases, that is where we have conflicts between the clients of the company and the company itself or we have conflicts between different companies, um, the only solution that exists is that one then resorts to arbitration by independent third parties. Emphasis on independent third parties. Um, and these independent third parties that are then used as arbitrators in cases of conflict between someone is insured and the insurance company or different insurance companies, these independent um, third parties must be parties that are trusted by both parties to the conflict. Um, and in addition, um, these third parties are also freely financed arbitration agencies that again stand in competition with each other, with other arbitration agencies. The clients, that is the insurers and the insured, uh, expect of these arbitrators, of these independent third parties, that they will come up with a verdict that is recognized as fair and just by all sides and only arbitrators that are capable of forming such judgments will succeed in the arbitration market because no arbitration agency can rely on the fact that it will be chosen in the next arbitration case again. You can turn to different companies if either of the conflicting parties is dissatisfied with the service performed by these arbitration agencies. Arbitrators that are incapable of forming judgments that are considered to be fair by all conflicting uh, clients uh, and they are, which are viewed as biased or partial will simply disappear from the market. I'll come back to, to this topic at, a little bit later again. Now from, from this fundamental advantage that is that there, are, that there exists a contractual relationship between uh, agencies that allegedly protect you and you who wants to be protected, uh, a number of additional advantages follow. 